All right. Open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read the first verse to you while you're turning there because you'll probably recognize it. Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy. It's one of the last letters that he wrote before he uh, well, either stopped writing or died. We're not exactly sure when the, the chronology of these things, but we know that he wrote this before he died. Okay. Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, But understand this, that in the last days will come perilous times of great stress and trouble. In the last days will come perilous times. Now, the last days is, uh, I didn't write down the Greek word, but it means the, the, the final times. But it's plural, which is interesting, because usually we talk about the end, you know, when I say the end times, but why is end times plural? It'll be one time, right? Well, we get that phrase from this and other verses where it refers to it in the plural. And the reason for its plurality is because it's talking about the perilous times. In other words, when the end starts to come, there will be peril upon peril upon peril upon peril. Uh, uh, Rick Renner said that it's like, um, it's like they're almost stumbling over each other as they, as they come out of into history. And that's the idea given here in the Greek that in the end times, perilous days or perilous times will come. The Greek word there for perilous is actually the word halepos, if I'm saying that right, kalepos, maybe, I don't know, it's K-H, I don't know how you pronounce that. And it means dangerous, difficult, fierce, furious, or even weakening. Dangerous because it is weakening you. That, I like that particular one because it gave the idea of a um, Oh, like a riptide, you know, where you're swimming out in the ocean and, the, and it starts to pull you farther out to the ocean. And so it weakens you and that's why it's dangerous. I had a friend tell a story of where he was out and got caught in a cold, a cold tide or something like that. And all of his limbs started to cramp up and he almost didn't make it back to shore because it weakened him. Now, this word kalepos is unique because it only exists or only occurs twice in the New Testament. This here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it says, In the last days, perilous times will come. But it's also used in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Now, in Matthew chapter 28, we see the story of the Gadarene demoniac. Some of you are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, it's just a fancy way of saying the demon-possessed guy from the region of the Gadarenes. We just call him the Gadarene demoniac because it's faster. We see this story in Matthew chapter 8 and again in Luke, but I'm not exactly sure where in Luke it, it occurs. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, it's talking about this, this man who lives in the tombs and cuts himself with stones and runs around with no clothes on and is always screaming and shouting. And he, he, they bind him with chains and he breaks the chains and they put fetters on his feet and he breaks the fetters. And he's just a very dangerous man. And it says, because of the ferocity of these men, because in, I think Matthew, one of them, it has two men instead of just one. Because of the ferocity of these men, no one could pass by that way. Now, if you knew that a crazy, psychotic, dangerous, violent, naked person <laughs> was running around in a certain area of town, you'd probably avoid that area of town. Not just because you might get exposed to an unpleasant image, but because this person could cause you bodily harm. He was dangerous. He was kalepos. He was perilous. That's the word that Paul uses here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 to describe the end times. They are dangerous. They can cause you harm. And he was warning Timothy, he says, know this. In the last days will come perilous times of great stress and trouble. That's from the uh, amplified version. Now, what are these perilous times? What's so dangerous about the end times? Now, those of you who are dispensationalists, most of you, you might be and not even know it, uh, the dispensational view of eschatology, boy, you guys are getting some words today, aren't you? The dispensationalist view of the end of the world is basically outlined in the Left Behind series, where there's a literal tribulation, all of the things occur literally, that kind of stuff. That's, that's called the dispensationalist viewpoint of eschatology. And a lot of Christians uh, subscribe to that now, because uh, mostly because of the popularity of those books, but also because of the way people interpret Scripture. It's not always the way we interpreted Revelation. Could be true. I really hope not, but it could be true. And uh, in the end, we believe that the perilous times at the end are because of the tribulation. But that's not the case. 
Because Paul doesn't say, in the end will come perilous times because you'll be persecuted for your faith and you'll be beheaded and there will be an antichrist. Let's see what he says here. Go to verse 2. He says, for, so there will be perilous times, for people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered, lovers of money and aroused by an inordinate greedy desire for wealth, proud and arrogant and contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy and profane. They will be without natural human affections, relentless, Excuse me, they will be slanderers, intemperate and loose on morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce, haters of the good, treacherous, rash, inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. What's the dangerous times at the end? It's the people. The people are the dangerous times at the end. I want to show you some of these words here. I'm going to switch over to the King James because in the King James they go word for word almost. That's the Amplified. That's where I just was. King James. There it is. Okay, in the King James it reads, let's do uh, start with verse 2, and we're going to take a look at some of these descriptions of these end times people. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That is the Greek word philautos. It comes from philos, meaning love or affection, and autos, meaning self. They will love themselves. Now, I love myself. I do. I like myself. Many of you may not. That's okay. You don't have to. I like myself, and that's, that's what counts. And God likes me. That's what really counts. But I do like myself. This is not just a love of self. It is the love of self to the exclusion of everyone else. I love myself so much that I can't love anybody else. You guys understand the, the difference there? Okay, that's philautos. The next word is lovers of self, and then it says uh, covetous. Covetous is the Greek word philagoros. Philagoros means the lover of money. Philos meaning love or lover, and then ar argoros probably. I don't know. I couldn't find the original word without the without the philos on there. It means someone who's greedy, someone who is in love with money and possessions. Then it says boasters. This is the Greek word aladzone. And aladzone means a, someone who boasts, someone who brags, but it gives the connotation of someone who brags specifically for self-gain. Look at me, how important I am. Look at what I'm able of do, to do. Now pay attention to me and pay me. Okay? Does that sound like Hollywood to anyone else in here? <laughs> All right, what's the next one? Proud. The Greek word for pride or proud there is hooper. Hooperite, hooper aphanos. Hello. It means appearing above others. Now, I can take pride in a job well done, and that's not this word. This is someone who likes to appear above other people. This is not someone who just feels they are superior. This is someone who acts superior. Or, but probably the best word I've seen to translate this, this is the word snob. Someone is, who is hooper aphanos, or whatever it is, is someone who is snobbish who looks down on other people, who sees themselves as above and acts accordingly. Now, the next word might be a little hard to understand in the Greek. It's the word blasphemer. In the Greek, it's blasphemos. We didn't get real creative on that one. <laughs> we just guys, you know what, I'm just going to write this one down. I don't need to come up with another word, blasphemer, blasphemer. Okay. Blasphemos means someone who ridicules or someone who insults. Now, in English, we see the word blasphemer. We think of someone who insults God, right? But in the Greek, that is not necessarily the case. This could be someone who ridicules and insults people as well, as well as God. So a blasphemer in the Greek, blas blasphemos, is someone who is always ridiculing, accusing, complaining, griping. That's a blasphemer, especially if it's against another person or against God. The next one's a neat word. Uh, this actually, this next word starts a series of words that start with the letter A. Does anybody know the significance of the prefix A in Greek? Oh, come on. We use it in English. What's that? Well, it is the Greek letter alpha, but it has a meaning. When you put it before a word, like aerobic means what? No, it doesn't mean sweat. <laughs> aerobic means oxygen. Aerobic exercise is someone who uses a lot of oxygen and burning fat. That's why they call it that way. You do a lot of breathing, okay? Anaerobic means what? Without oxygen. That's right. 
Okay, uh, we've got words like, you know, anaerobic, asexual, asocial. We put the A before the word because it means not or without the thing that's at the end. So most of the rest of these words are going to be without something. And that's important. That's an important distinction. So it says here in the King James, disobedient to parents, but it's actually one word. Epithase. Epithase means not persuadable. Epithase. Not persuadable. This is someone who's thick-headed. Someone that you cannot persuade to change their mind. Even their parents can't change their mind. Okay? Anybody know anybody like that? Just a little bit stubborn? I got a couple kids like that. <laughs> I myself am like that at times. And we're all a little bit stubborn. This is someone who's simply unpersuadable. You can't change their mind about anything. The next one is unthankful. This is a karistos. Uh, a charistos means not a charistos thankful. In other words, this is someone that is without gratitude. Let me describe this person to you so you can get an idea of how close we are to these end times in our country. This word means someone who has been given something that they have no gratitude for. In other words, they feel entitled to what you gave them, even if they didn't earn it. Sound familiar? Sounds like our country, doesn't it? In a lot of ways, we have people that feel that the government or, or your society or your friends or your family owes you something. That's what this word means. They are unthankful, ingrateful, and they feel entitled. The next word is, um, what is it? unholy. This is the word uh, a, a, a nosios. i got to get the accents right. It means not a, and the nosios, uh, wholesome, good, pure. So by implication, it indicates that these people are not wholesome, pure, and good. They are, in fact, lewd and vulgar. That's why some of your translations will use those words instead of unholy, because that it's not just an unholy as in imperfect. It is unholy as in everything they, they do is, is just icky. It's bad. It's not good. Okay, the next word. Uh, verse 3, without natural affections. I always thought that's an interesting way to translate that. It is actually the word es or estorgos. Anybody recognize the word storgos? You guys don't remember your Greek? Agape, phileo, eros, and storgos. Those are the four words for love in the Greek language. Storge, or storgos in this case, is a familial love. It's a love for your children, a love for your spouse, a love for your parents, okay? Uh, agape is a giving love, eros is a physical love, phileo is a friendly love, and storge is a familial love, love for family. This is someone who is a storgos. They were without love even for the people that they should love the most, now, as I was preparing this, I heard a little argument in the back of my head. But, uh, Pastor Micah, my family doesn't love me. <laughs> and I don't love my family. We don't get along at all. You want to know why family irritates us so much? Because we want to love each other. If we didn't want to love each other, they wouldn't bother us so much. If you don't care what somebody thinks about you, then it's not going to affect you whether they like you or not. But in family, we are supposed to love each other. We know we're supposed to love each other. And when we don't love each other, it's just that much worse. These people don't even have that. They are a storgos. No love for family. That's why it says without natural affections in the King James, because it is something natural to love your family. The next word is a truce breaker. That's aspondos. Aspondos means not faithful to promises. That one's pretty simple. The next one's fascinating, though. I saw this in, on my program. You know, it's got the English word, and then it's got the Strong's number after it. And you click on it, and it gives you the, the definition down below. I clicked on it, read the definition, and thought, oh, I must have clicked on the wrong word. Let me show you what it is. It is the word uh, false accusers. When I clicked on it, it was the word diabolos. Anybody know what the word diabolos means? The devil. Yeah, in, in Spanish and Latin and Italian and Portuguese and maybe French. I'm not sure about French. Diablo means the devil. In fact, this word diabolos is used as the proper noun for the devil in the New Testament. And here he's using it to describe people. Now, you guys remember I told you a long time ago what the name Satan actually means in Greek? Anybody remember what it means? Nobody remembers? I know, you guys are just like, I don't remember. Uh, it's okay if you don't remember. It's the accuser. 
Satan is the one who accuses. In fact, the Bible says that he is forever accusing the brethren. Okay, that's Satan. And that's Diablos. So the person who is an accuser, who's always accusing people of things, whether verbally or just internally, these are people that think negative of everybody. And they're always accusing other people of stuff. Now, it says false accuser, but the word Diablos literally just means an accuser or a slanderer. So false is actually added, added in. Okay, the next word is... I lost my place here. Where am I? Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Uh, that one threw me for a loop because I thought incontinence was the inability to control your bladder. But maybe that's just because bladder control commercials, they're the only place I've ever seen that word used. But in the Greek, it is the Greek word akatrase uh, or akratase or something, I can't remember. It just means a lack of self-control. So if you have bladder incontinence, you have no control over your bladder. But this is not bladder. This is just your life. No self-control. You just do whatever you think, whatever you want. That's the type of people that live in the end times. They lack self-control. The next one is fierce. Now, this is not the kalapos like we saw before. This is actually the word a nameros. A nameros is a without, and nameros means to tame. So like, let's say you get a wild animal, like um, like a lion or a bear or one of Cheryl's dogs or something like that, okay? And then you, <laughs> and then you try to tame it. You try to take it from its, those of you who've never met Cheryl's dogs, you don't know what I'm talking about. Those of us who've been there, we know. Uh, you try to take that wild beast and take the wild out of it, okay? Like taking a Mustang horse and breaking it so that it is no longer wild. That's the Greek word here, only it's a nemeros. That means without taming. In other words, it's still wild. People in these last days are going to be animalistic in their nature. They're not only going to do whatever they want, they're going to do whatever they want to other people. Sound familiar? Isn't that how we live in a lot of the areas in our country today where people just do whatever they want and they do whatever they want to other people? The next word despisers of those that are good. It's actually one word. It's a compound word. A philagathos. A meaning not. Phil meaning philos or love. And agathos meaning the good. Things that are good or you could by implication say people that are good. Therefore, these are people that are hostile to virtue. You ever met anybody like that? It's really fun being a pastor because you meet people and say, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Two things will happen. They'll either apologize for the foul language they just used the seconds before, which, whatever, uh, or they'll get quiet. And sometimes they'll even get a little sour against you. Oh, you're a pastor, huh? That is this word, a philagathos, a lack of love for things that are good. They're hostile to virtue. The next word is denying, or no, sorry. The next word is traitors. This is the Greek word uh, podotsa, podotses, which means uh, to give something into the enemy's hand or surrender to the enemies. This isn't just traitor. This is treasonous. Someone who is treasonous. Someone who will turn on you. Hedi is the Greek word propetase, uh, which is uh, uh, literally means to fall forward, like like to trip and to fall headlong into something. These are people that are rash. They don't think about what they're doing. They just go and do it. Uh, the next word, trying to get through these, lovers of pleasure. I like this one. It is, uh, oh no, I missed one, didn't I? High-mindedness. Oh, this is a good one too. High-mindedness is the Greek word tufuo. Tufuo literally means to be surrounded with smoke. But how do you get high-minded out of surrounded with smoke? Well, the Greeks had this idea. When you surround yourself with smoke, you look bigger than you really are. It's translated in, I think, 1 Corinthians chapter... I got it written down here. First Corinthians, somewhere. Where is it? First Corinthians, oh, it's over here. <laughs> First Corinthians 8, verse 1. Love builds up, but uh, knowledge puffs up. That word puffs up is this same word. To be filled with smoke instead of surrounded with smoke. We would say they got a big head and it's not filled with anything worthwhile. <laughs> That's the idea that this Greek word gets across. These are people who think that they're so important and so intelligent and so right all the time. The next word is a lover of pleasure. This is phil edenos. Phil meaning love. And then edenos meaning pleasure or enjoyment. Now this is a, uh, one of the words in the um, Thayer's dictionary said uh, voluptuous. I had to look that word up. 
I thought I knew what it meant, but it didn't make sense with what I was reading here. Voluptuous actually means having anything to do with the senses. Beautiful sounds, beautiful sights, beautiful smells, beautiful tastes, beautiful touch. Okay, that's this word. So these are people who love to have their senses tingled. Okay, does that sound like America to you? Or what do we spend most of our time when we're not working doing? Entertainment. It's just puffing up the senses. Now, these are people who love pleasure more than, or the Amplified adds, rather than lovers of God. This is actually philotheos. Philotheos means the lover of God or anything good. So these are people who love their pleasure more than they love God. Okay, everybody got that? Does that sound like a happy, friendly, safe group of people to hang with? doesn't, does it? Let me show you one more verse here. Go to verse 5. Er. Yeah, verse, yeah, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The word power there is the Greek word dunamis. I've used it many times before. And it means force, energy, strength. So they have a excuse me, a form of godliness, but deny its power. Now, the power can be the denial of the miracles, okay? But I don't think that's what it's talking about in this place. Because of the context, I believe Paul is saying that these people will have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God to actually change your life. In other words, these are religious people. Not just verse 5, verses 2 through 5. These people who are rash... These people who don't love their families. These people who are ridiculing. People who think they're above other people who are boasters or love money. People who are not self-controlled, who are fierce and mean and cruel. They don't love God and therefore are hostile to people that are real and they're in church. That's who this is talking about. How do I know that? Look at the end of verse 5. Paul says, from such, where'd he go? Verse 5, from such, turn away, or you could say stay away or avoid. Many translations say avoid. Now, Paul says in another place, he says, I'm not saying that you should stay away from sinners who sin, because otherwise you'd have to leave the whole world, because the world is filled with people who do stuff like this, right? He says, stay away from people who have a form of godliness, but deny its power and therefore live like this. Religious people. Now, I know for many of you that are older generation, the word religious means something different than it does to my generation. To you, religion means something good. But understand that today when I use the term religion, I'm not talking about uh, spiritual disciplines or faith in Jesus Christ. I'm talking about people who are trying to get to God their own way. They have a form of godliness. They sound pious when they pray, but they sound vulgar when they talk. They look friendly when they're in church, but they're rash, they're mean, they're accusers when they're outside those doors. Anybody know anybody like that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> and don't point to anyone in the church. Right? <laughs> Paul says in the last days are going to come these dangerous times. And these dangerous times are dangerous like the gathering demoniac. They're, they're times that are filled with physical danger and violence and uncontrollableness and, 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 and destructiveness, perverseness, and the danger of harm. That's what these times are going to look like. Uh-oh. That's what these times are going to look like. They're going to look like this demon-possessed man. Do religious people look like a demon-possessed man? On the surface, they look real nice. They got their ties. Their ties even match their shirts. <laughs> you know, they, they say, good morning, how are you? And they even sound like they mean it. How can you tell the difference between someone who looks like a believer in Jesus and someone who is merely a pretender but denying the power of the Spirit for a changed life? You have to look at the fruit. What does their life produce? And let me just say this. What does your life produce? Got personal, didn't it? You would think it is somebody else, weren't you? 
You were thinking about your neighbor down the street that doesn't treat you right, or your boss that mistreats you and doesn't pay you enough, or your spouse that's always mean to you, your kids that don't respect you. What about you? What does your life produce? Does it produce love, joy, and peace? Does it produce faith, hope, and love? Or does it produce things like lovers of money, self-centeredness, thoughts of high-mindedness, anger and rage and danger, a lack of love for family, accusations and slander, a lack of self-control, a lack of love for the things of God, but instead a love for the things of the world. Is it possible that you're one of these people Paul's talking about? Now, I'll just wager this. This is the list of the words in that text. You got some of this, probably. I know I do. I found too many that I want to admit to (laughs) on this list in my life. But you know what I don't? I don't deny the fact that God can change my life. And that's what makes me not dangerous. Because it's the denying of the power of God to change that sinful nature in your flesh. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. The sinful nature in our flesh. It is the power of God or the faith in that that prevents me from exercising all of these problems that I have inside my flesh. Now, let me ask you a question. Let's move from that into something else. What is so dangerous about bad people? And Paul compared these times to a demon-possessed man that could break iron handcuffs. What is so dangerous about a life filled with these kinds of people? Well, let me describe part of, describe it in three ways. First of all, it's a trap, to quote Star Wars. It's a trap! Nobody? A couple of you? Okay, fine. Not enough nerds in this church. Uh, all right. Uh, sin is a trap! We think I'm not being fulfilled. So I'm going to try to focus on myself more so that I can be fulfilled. It's like swimming into a whirlpool. You swim into the whirlpool, and it's uh, still I'm still not being fulfilled. So you focus more on yourself. You swim harder, and you start to get closer to the center. And it's still not fulfilling, so you swim harder, and you get closer to the center, and you focus more and more and more and more and more on yourself until you get sucked down and destroyed. That's what sin is. It is a focus on ourselves at the exclusion of God and other people. That's why Paul's first comment here is philautos, a lover of self. Everything else can be just listed under a lover of self. When we love ourselves too much at the exclusion of God and other people, we destroy ourselves. So that's the first reason. The second reason is imagine a society where everyone was out for themselves and no one helped anybody unless it was good for them. Wait a minute, I just described our culture, didn't I? (laughs) It's not a safe place to live anymore, is it? We used to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now we're the land of locked doors, alarm systems, school shootings. Why? Because we're focusing on ourselves. It's a a society built on selfishness is a very dangerous place. And of course, if we're talking about religious people, we all know that they are the most vicious of all types of people. So what's Paul's solution? Go to the end of verse 5. There's perilous times coming. All these people are going to be horrible. So, from such, turn away. That's step number one. Avoid religious people in your life. Now, sometimes you can't avoid them, but do your best. Why? Because religion, religious people will always draw you into a self-centered attitude. It's kind of like competition. I remember talking with uh, the Hammer ministers one time, and I said, you know, if you get all the pastors in town, and we all get together, and none of us try to promote ourselves above somebody else, we will cooperate. But as soon as one person decides, I'm out for myself, everyone goes, oh, well, I better be out for myself too, or I'm not going to get any, right? As soon as one selfish person enters the bunch, everyone else starts looking out for themselves. That's why it's so important to stay away from religious people because they will draw you into their selfishness. They will draw you into their self-destruction and they will betray you. They will turn their back on you. They are traitors, remember? They will harm you and they'll even give you a bad reputation. Well, I know so-and-so says he's a Christian, but he hangs out with so-and-so. Can't be a good Christian. Go to verse 10. 
Paul's talking to Timothy here. He says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, suffering, charity, and patience. Paul tells Timothy, if you want to avoid or survive this perilous time, be like me. Live a life of faith, a life of love, a life of patience, and a life of endurance through persecution. Why? Because when you're surrounded about with evil and faithlessness and selfishness as this end times will be, the only thing that will keep you safe is staying focused on what's good. Think about Lot who moved into the city of Sodom. He had to be dragged out of the city by the angels because he was like, no, I want to stay here. I'm a lover of Sodom. <laughs> He's like, it's going to be destroyed. I don't care. I don't know what was going through his head. <laughs> Maybe he didn't believe the angels. I don't know. But he had to be dragged out of the city because he had been around the sin for so long that it had penetrated his heart and he no longer lived a life of faith like he did when he was around Abraham, who was a man of faith. Go to verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and which hast been assured of, knowing, uh, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, there's a lot of thous and thuses in that one. But continue in the things that you have learned. Step number three is remaining faithful to what God has shown you. This is very important. Now, understand, we're going to get to the Bible here in just a minute, okay? It's next in the verses, so I'm not talking about it first, although it is more important. But what God has taught you in your life, hold on to that. Don't let that go. Because it says, uh, where does it say it? In... Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus says, be careful how you listen. And then after that, he says, to him who is given, or to him who has, much more will be given, but to him who has none, even what he has will be taken from him. What does he mean? He means if God teaches you something, if you listen and God speaks to you and you receive a revelation, but you don't hold on to it, it will be taken from you. You don't want to lose what God has given you already. You want to know why? Because God's not in the habit of giving you the next step until you've done the one he told you to do. You want to know how to get from here to there and all you got is the first step? Do that step! Because until you take that step, God will not show you the next. Most times. Sometimes he does. Because he's a very gracious God. But he is not in the habit of doing that. We must remain faithful to what God has taught us so that we can, A, accomplish what he's called us to do, and B, move on to the next thing. Look at verse 15. And, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So not, don't just hold on to the things God has taught you. Hold on to your Bible. And I don't just mean hold on to it. I mean hold on to what it says. Read it, know it, memorize it, and then practice what it says. Imagine yourself in these last days in a big storm. It's perilous times, right? When you're in a big storm and you know that right over there are some pretty dangerous rocks, what do you do? You drop an anchor so that you don't get blown into the rocks. The Bible is our anchor in a world where everything is relative, where everything is, you know, I make up my own morality, I make up my own God, I'm going to decide for myself what is true, and nothing is entirely true, which is a ridiculous, logically inept statement. But people believe that. I don't know how, but they do. In a world like that, where it's all about me, and what I want and what I need, and it's not about anybody else, you are going to be tossed about. But the Bible says, do not be tossed about by any wind and wave of doctrine. You need to be anchored to the sea floor with the word of God. Because as much as our culture may change, this doesn't. And I don't care who's told you that the Bible has, oh, you know, it's, there's so many errors in there from, you know, centuries and millennia of copying it. it. It doesn't even make sense anymore. They are not telling you the truth. Science has proven that to be false. What you have in your hands, other than the fact it's in English, is basically the same thing they had 2,000 years ago in the first century. Okay? It doesn't change, because the God who wrote it doesn't change. Your society will change, even you will change, but the Bible will not. Use it as an anchor to hold you steadfast, to keep you from drifting away from His grace 
His mercy and His salvation. Go to verse 17. That the man of God may be perfectly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That word furnished can also mean equipped. Many, many translations say that they will be equipped for every good work. Number one, stay away from religious people. Number two, live a life of faith, love, patience, and endurance. Number three, remain faithful to what God has taught you. Number four, remain faithful to Scripture. And number five, keep your armor on. If you ever watch fantasy movies, the good guy always dies when he takes his armor off. Somebody sneaks up and stabs him because he's got his armor off. You can't beat him in the battlefield because he's got his sword and his axe and his shield. Apparently he has three hands. And, you know, all of his armor all over him. You can't get to him, but he takes his armor off and all you need is a little knife. And he's dead. Keep your armor on because you never actually leave the battlefield until the day that you take your last breath. And if you don't stay dressed for battle, you will get beaten. You will. In fact, many of our times in our lives where we experience failure, it's because we took our armor off. We forgot to hold up our faith. We forgot to keep the truth buckled around us that holds it all in place. We forgot to protect our heart with righteousness of Christ. We forgot to protect our head with the salvation. There's more. I can't remember them. <laughs> How about the sword of the Spirit? Try going into battle without a weapon. You have to keep your armor on if you're going to be successful. And I like what it says, verse 17, look at it again. That the man of God may be perfectly, thoroughly furnished or equipped, that's your armor, unto all good works. Now, what does that imply? It implies that God is going to equip you for good works, so you should probably do them. Now, that's the last step. Do what God's called you to do. Be obedient to what he's done or what he's asked. Perilous times are coming if they're not already here. And the Bible says that many are going to lose their faith because their heart's going to grow cold. Why does that happen? Because they live in a society of coldness. Take a hot stone, throw it out in a cold day, and it'll cool a lot faster than it does if you throw it out in the Kansas summer sun. In fact, it probably won't cool off if you throw it out in the Kansas summer sun. But this world is going to get cold. Even, even Hoxie, Kansas, a place where saying you're a Christian won't get you ridiculed by most people. Okay, where behaving is the, is the norm. Even in a place like this, it's going to get cold. So people who need to stay hot for Jesus need to maintain that some way. They have to stay on fire by doing these things here or they will be swept away with the storms that are coming. Heed Paul's warning. Stay ready. Stay willing. And always fight. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your warnings and your word to tell us about the times to come. And Lord, I don't know if we're in the last days or if we're you know, leading up to the last days or what's going on, but I know that these are perilous times and that the things that Paul described are things that are going on right now. And so, Father, I pray that each of us would listen to Paul's warning, that we would hold on to what you've taught us, hold on to your word, hold on to the faith and love that your spirit has given us and to be obedient and to keep our armor on. Thank you, Lord, that we can do these things through the power of your Spirit. And thank you that you've given us the grace, not just to give us the warning, but to be with us and to help us do it because we are too weak in ourselves. And Father, as much as I don't want to, I thank you for the fight because I know that through the victory we will gain many crowns. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.